Shalom everyone and welcome to this week's edition of Torah Gems. I'm Rob, your host. This week we're going to be discussing the Torah portion Naso, or Count. Um, there's a lot contained in this Torah portion. And as always, my commentaries are designed to inspire people to look into the whole counsel of God at Genesis to Revelation and maybe throw a few tidbits or gems your way. This week, um, I'm not going to go into details about uh, too much in a heavy way. But what I want to talk about this week is, it, it, with the proximity to Shavuot or Pentecost, the, the law of jealousy, okay, and a type of picture of the bride of Messiah, and how it also ties in with the Nazarite vow. Uh, something really exciting that I noticed this week between the reading out of the Torah and the prophets and judges where it talks about Samson. This week... Uh, we see the law of jealousy, okay? Now, we, the first time that we see the law of jealousy is when um, Moshe or Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets, with the commandments, the ten, you know, uh, sayings or commandments on them. And when they found the golden calf, they did the test for the law of jealousy, okay? And 3,000 perished that day. Now, I'm going to come back to this later, but on Shavuot, uh, after the ascension of Yeshua, they were waiting on him in Jerusalem, which is a type of picture of following the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God. What is waiting on the Lord? Like, we sit and we wait physically, but what do we do? I, I had it uh, illustrated to me by a good, beloved friend of mine, where waiting on the Lord is literally waiting on the Lord. You go to a restaurant, you get waited on. We serve the Lord. How do we serve the Lord? First John says it. We can meet, keep his commandments, statutes, commandments, we, we statutes. discern between the difference between clean and unclean, holy and unholy, and about God's feast days. And of course, they were waiting on the Lord in Jerusalem. They were in the upper room. I'm going to get into that in another separate commentary on sh the proximity. What we see here is <clears throat> the law of jealousy and how it pertains to a husband who's even even suspects his wife. And the type of picture through that scripture where... The priest gives her a lot of opportunities to repent. Now that seems sexist, okay? It does seem sexist because we don't see the law of jealousy. Certain denominations have made that very clear. And, and, you know, that's not the whole picture, though. We need a Hebraic understanding of Scripture to see what God's saying. He's prophesying there about the end times. He's also prophesying about the bride of Yeshua, who is Israel. It's not the church that replaces Israel. It is anybody who has joined their self, themselves to the vine, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ephesians chapter 2. I've been majoring on that one a lot this year because identity is so important. How do we adulterate ourselves from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, <laughs> you know, every time it talks about Israel and disobedience throughout our Tanakh, which is the Torah and the prophets, we and, and the writings, we see, um, he talks about they played the harlot. It's a spiritual, you know, you know, tests and tribulations. Forget it, Lord, I give up on you, I'm going to go do my own thing. You can actually adulterate yourself spiritually from God to yourself, setting yourself up as God, the very sin of Hasatan himself. So, we see this type of picture of the law of jealousy. The very next thing talks about the Nazarite vow and the, the process that a Nazarite was to go through to make himself holy unto Yahweh, unto yud heh vav -Heh. And there, there was, you know, specific instructions laid out there. We can go into the details and how that relates to it, but what um, my heart is this week is to turn that around. You see the picture of Samson, and we know what happened in Samson's life. Samson was a mighty man of God. Um, he was a judge of Israel. In other words, he would have been, you know, what we would call today a bet din, a house of judgment, where people would come to him with matters of Torah for did the test for the law. Of course, talking about binding or forbidding or and loosing or allowing, and whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven, whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. It's not necessarily about, I loose the spirit on your praise, Jesus. That's kind of an improper interpretation because we don't invoke the spirit of God on people. That's witchcraft. God shows up where and when. He, he sees fit, and he does answer prayer in that area. But, so we see that, and, and, and so that would have been, you know, Samson's job, okay? So we see that he joins himself to somebody that he shouldn't join himself, born out of lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye, and, of course, the boastful pride of life, the downfall of man um, that is in every one of us, that the process of redemption in Messiah Yeshua is what talks about. 
And I want to discuss something that's near and dear to my heart this week um, in spiritual adultery and how, I mean, we've seen in the church, you know, kind of a Samson-esque kind of thing where the church loses its eyes, its vision, you know, or its lampstand, according to Revelation, because of mixing of hot and cold, one type of thing with another, or syncretism, mixing a pagan idolatry worship with the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God, loses its lampstand, loses the vision, okay? And, and of course, through that, uh, loses discernment, because true biblical con discernment comes from the full counsel of God, Genesis to Revelation, empowered by the Spirit, which is what Shavuot, or Pentecost, is truly all about. I also want to take time to address some things I've seen in the quote-unquote messianic movement. Um, denial of the divinity of Yeshua. Uh, to God principle, where they say that Yeshua is God, but not of the Father, because they have a Hellenistic understanding of how Yeshua relates to his Father in Heaven. He's doing it as an example. Yeshua perfectly lived out the Torah as an example to us how to live out God's teaching and instruction in spirit, and in truth. Uh, and Yeshua says it himself, of course, you know, where the time is come and is coming, where true, the true worshippers of the Father will worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus does not come to do away with the Torah of God. He comes to fulfill it. In other words, bring it to an understand, greater understanding or to cause it to stand. You know, before uh, people who are involved in the, in the full counsel of God begin to sling accusations at the church, we have to be careful because... You know, even with our, in our own ranks, there are those who are involved in spiritual adultery. And we have to use the discernment of God. The discernment comes through the knowledge of Scripture and the Holy Spirit's leading in that. That leads us into all truth. Okay? And one of the things, you know, that, that the quote-unquote messianic movement likes to major on is what's wrong with the church and how they celebrate these pagan holy days and all this stuff. You know... I think it's enough as a people to be educated and want to serve God beyond that, as opposed to consistently majoring on what's wrong with everybody else. I mean, there's one part of us that needs to educate, but there comes a point when we need to move away from that and move on to inspiring others by what we do, in instead of inspiring others by telling them what you're doing is wrong. Trying to walk out the Torah without Yeshua is, is, is legalism, and, and trying to walk, out, walk with Yeshua without Torah is going to lead to deception. You know, we can see that in all kinds of charismatic movements where people are focused on the Spirit, the Spirit, the Spirit, and they get led astray quite easily because they're seeking after miracle signs and wonders. It's, there's nothing wrong with loving to see a miracle sign and wonder, but Yeshua himself said, you know, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except for the sign of Jonah. So, I take Yeshua's words very seriously, but the things I want to address are spiritual adultery, which would not pass the test, of the, the adulterous bride test. I mean, the bride is, is to present herself without spot or wrinkle. We're going through wedding preparations, which is we walk out the commandments, statutes, and judgments of God, and we walk out his calendar specifically um, as, a, as a way of preparing ourselves for the groom's return. And, and, you know, people are caught up in silly arguments about the name of God, you know, like God is Yahweh, yud heh vav we know this, and, you know, so if I don't call him Yahshua, instead, and I call him Yeshua, am I following a different God? Oh, I even got all my Babylonian-ness off of me, like, that's legalism, people, you know, that's a, that's a cult kind of a mentality, as, as, as is, you know, um, other things that I begin to see, you know, denial of the of the messiahship of Yeshua or denial of his divinity. If we don't believe that God is one, then we believe in a different God because Yeshua is God in the flesh. And if we don't believe that Yeshua is God in the flesh, then we don't believe in God. And that's the way it is, you know. So it's something to watch out for, something to inspire you to, to be biblically led in all things, okay. There's, there's, there's no room for movement on this one with God, and, and he's very serious about uh, spiritual adultery. So in these days, continue with the bridal preparations, people, because Yeshua is returning for a bride without spot or winko. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Have a good week. For something to inspire.